We live in an age of disposable things. Even our strongest materials, like steel, eventually give up and turn to dust. This is a modern piece of high-grade steel, after just a couple of years exposed to the elements, corroded, flaking away, useless. Here's something remarkable. This is an iron nail, forged by a Viking blacksmith over a thousand years ago. While countless others have rusted away, this one is in a stunning state of preservation. How is this possible? They didn't have our modern rust-proof coatings or advanced alloys. They had fire, rock, and a profound understanding of their materials. This got researchers asking a fundamental question, was there a forgotten secret that made their iron so resilient? The answer isn't a magical treatment they applied to the iron. The secret is what they left inside it. And to understand it, we have to journey back and rediscover a lost technology that challenges our modern way of thinking. Before we dive in, let me know in the comments, what's the most surprising old object you've ever seen that's still in amazing condition? Let us know below. Section 1. The Modern Epidemic of Rust Before we travel back a thousand years, we have to confront the problem we live with every day, rust. It's so common we barely notice it anymore. The reddish-brown stain on a bridge, the bubbling paint on an old car, the garden shears you left out in the rain that now look a decade old. We accept it as a law of nature that iron and steel will always surrender to the elements. But this isn't just an aesthetic problem. It's a colossal economic disaster. The global cost of corrosion is estimated to be over $2.5 trillion every year. That's trillion, with a capital T, representing over 3% of the world's GDP. Money spent replacing infrastructure, repairing pipelines, and fighting a battle we always seem to be losing. Bridges are weakened, ships are compromised, and the very skeleton of our industrial world is constantly being eaten away. The basic science is something many of us learn in school. Iron, when exposed to oxygen and water, undergoes an electrochemical reaction. It oxidizes, reverting to a more stable state, similar to the ore it came from. We call this process corrosion. The problem is, the rust that forms on common steels is porous and flaky. It doesn't seal the metal underneath. Instead, it traps moisture and actually accelerates the corrosion, eating deeper until there's nothing left. For 150 years, our best minds have been dedicated to stopping this. We create complex alloys like stainless steel by adding elements like chromium. We coat steel in zinc in a process called galvanization, using the zinc as a sacrificial metal. We paint it. We powder coat it. We use all sorts of clever methods. And yet it often seems to be a temporary fix. Scratch the paint, and a blister of rust appears. A chip in a coating becomes a massive failure point. Our solutions are often just skin deep. We've come to believe that iron is inherently flawed. But what if that belief is wrong? What if the problem isn't the iron itself, but how we make it? Our entire modern approach is based on a single principle, purity. We use colossal furnaces to create rivers of molten metal, burning away impurities with ferocious heat. And in our quest for this idealized perfection, we may have engineered out the very thing that made its ancient counterpart so resilient. Section 2. The Viking Anomaly The evidence is sitting quietly in museums across northern Europe. Thousands of Viking artifacts have been pulled from the earth, from riverbeds and from burial mounds. Now it's important to be clear, many of these are heavily corroded after a thousand years but a startling number are in a remarkable state of preservation, which is what puzzles scientists. We see nails and rivets from their legendary longships, tools, and most famously, their weapons. Consider the Ulfbaret swords. Dating from the 9th to 11th centuries, these blades were metallurgical anomalies. They were made of a high-carbon crucible steel with a consistency that experts believed was impossible for the era. This material was imported from Asia or the Middle East through Viking trade routes, a technology that wouldn't appear in European production for another 800 years. These elite swords were strong, flexible, and possessed a strange resistance to decay. 
Only a handful of authenticated Ulfbert blades were made from true crucible steel, and they required imported materials and specialized knowledge. What's truly remarkable is the common Viking iron. The everyday tools, the ship rivets, the ordinary weapons used by regular people. These mundane objects are sometimes found in better condition than modern iron would be after just a few decades in the same environment. This is what we need to understand. So what was going on? For centuries, the answer was shrouded in myth. But to solve this riddle, we can't just look at the finished artifact. We have to become detectives. We have to reconstruct the process. The Viking blacksmith wasn't just a brute with a hammer. He was a master of a technology so subtle that we are only now, with all our modern tools, beginning to appreciate its genius. Section 3. The Heart of the Forge. The Bloomery. To understand Viking iron, you first have to understand how we make steel today, and then you have to forget all of it. A modern steel mill is a monument to brute force. We use a blast furnace, superheating iron ore to temperatures over 1,500 degrees Celsius, far above iron's melting point. This creates huge quantities of liquid pig iron, which is then blasted with oxygen to burn off impurities. The philosophy is one of purification through overwhelming force. Now let's step back a thousand years. The furnace is not a towering silo. It's a humble structure of clay and stone called a bloomery, and it operates on a radically different principle. The most crucial secret is its temperature. A Viking smith is not trying to melt the iron. The bloomery operates at a lower temperature, around 1200 degrees Celsius. This is hot enough to melt the non-metallic impurities in the ore, but it is below the melting point of iron itself. This is not a mistake. It is the entire point. The process begins with bog iron, a renewable resource harvested from marshes across Scandinavia. This ore is roasted and broken into pieces. The other key ingredient is charcoal, not coal. This choice matters more than you might think. Coal contains sulfur, an element that poisons iron, making it brittle and prone to cracking. Charcoal burns clean, leaving only carbon to fuel the chemical reduction. This seemingly simple choice, wood over coal, is the difference between a sword that lasts generations and one that shatters in the first battle. The smith loads the bloomery with charcoal, heats it with hand-pumped bellows, and then begins adding alternating layers of ore and more charcoal. Inside, a beautiful chemical dance begins. The hot air rising through the charcoal creates carbon monoxide gas. This gas is hungry for oxygen and rips it away from the iron ore, leaving behind tiny solid particles of metallic iron. This process is called reduction. Because the furnace is below iron's melting point, these particles never become liquid. Instead, as they sink, they begin to stick together, coalescing into a single, spongy, porous mass of solid iron, the bloom. This bloom is intimately mixed with the melted, non-metallic parts of the ore, the glassy waste called slag. The slag coats the iron particles, protecting them from reoxidizing. After many hours, the smith breaks open the furnace and pulls out the bloom, a glowing slag-encrusted lump of sponge iron. To an untrained eye, it's a mess, but to the smith, it is a treasure, holding the secret to its own longevity. Section 4, Forging an Impurity into a Superpower The glowing, porous bloom that emerges from the furnace is a long way from being a sword or a nail. It's a metallic sponge filled with glassy impurities. A modern metallurgist would see this as a problem. The Viking blacksmith sees it as potential. The first step is consolidation. The red-hot bloom is hammered powerfully, which compacts the spongy iron and squeezes out much of the liquid slag in a shower of fiery sparks. For high-status items like swords and axes, this is followed by a more ingenious technique, folding and forge welding. The smith hammers the iron into a bar, heats it, folds it back on itself, and hammers the layers until they fuse into a single piece. Then he does it again and again. After just a few folds, the bar contains dozens or hundreds of paper-thin layers. Now, here is the great revelation.
This process does not remove all of the slag. That was never the goal. Instead, the remnants of slag are stretched and flattened into incredibly thin microscopic filaments that run throughout the metal like threads of glass woven into the fabric of the iron. And this is the secret to the iron's incredible rust resistance. In modern homogeneous steel, once rust gets a foothold, it has a clear uninterrupted highway to travel deeper into the material. But in this ancient wrought iron, the story is different. When corrosion starts, it almost immediately runs into one of these microscopic layers of silicate slag. The slag is chemically inert. It's glass. It acts as a physical barrier, a dead end. The corrosive process is stopped in its tracks. Viking longships crossed oceans with salt water constantly bathing their iron rivets and nails. Modern steel corrodes in months under these conditions. Yet Viking iron artifacts recovered from shipwrecks show remarkable preservation. The slag-rich structure creates millions of tiny barriers that prevent salt water from penetrating deep into the metal. Each fiber of slag acts like a waterproof seal, compartmentalizing corrosion into harmless surface spots instead of structural decay. Archaeological evidence from Lonzo Meadows in Newfoundland, where Vikings produced iron around 1021 AD, shows they successfully smelted iron even in challenging maritime environments. The iron produced there, though made by less skilled workers, still demonstrates this fundamental resilience. If this is blowing your mind, hit that like button and subscribe. It helps us bring you more forgotten secrets like this, in some cases, other elements present in the original bog ore, like phosphorus, also help by forming a passive, protective chemical film on the surface, adding another layer of defense. The bog iron that Vikings harvested naturally contained phosphorus, which creates a crystalline protective layer when the iron slowly oxidizes over time. This wasn't planned. It was an accidental benefit of using the materials their environment provided. The result is a metal that is, in a sense, self-protecting. The so-called impurity that modern methods obsessively remove, the slag, is precisely the ingredient that gives the iron its longevity. The Viking smiths had intuitively engineered a metal matrix composite with rust-proofing built into its very structure, the ritual that was actually chemistry. But there's another technique that sounds like pure alchemy, adding animal bones to the furnace. Historical texts mention this practice, and for centuries we thought it was superstition. Then modern experimental archaeology revealed the truth. When bones burn at high temperatures, they release phosphorus that integrates into the iron. Modern analysis of Viking blades sometimes reveals bright white streaks, phosphorus-rich iron that was deliberately created through this process. The smiths didn't know they were adding phosphorus. They had no concept of elements or chemistry. They just knew through generations of experience that iron smelted with bones resisted rust better. It was chemistry disguised as ritual. Viking smiths were master recyclers. The slag from previous smelts still contained iron particles. Rather than waste it, they would break it up and feed it back into the bloomery with fresh ore. This recycled slag created even more intricate fiber networks in the new bloom. Each generation of iron became more complex, more protected, building up layers of rust resistance like tree rings, recording years of growth. Here's the paradox. When modern blacksmiths recreate Viking bloomeries, they've discovered that the cleanest smelts, those that remove the most slag, actually produce inferior iron. The best blooms are the dirty ones, where slag and iron remain intimately mixed. Vikings intuitively understood this. They weren't trying to purify the iron to perfection. They were trying to achieve the perfect imperfection. Just enough slag to armor the iron, but not so much it becomes brittle. Section 5. The Pure Problem of Modern Steel Now we can return to that piece of rusted modern steel and understand the tragic irony. Its weakness stems from what we consider its greatest strength, its purity and uniformity. Modern steelmaking is a process of aggressive refinement. The goal is to produce a homogeneous liquid free of contaminants, resulting in a steel that is incredibly strong and predictable. 
from a structural standpoint, it's a marvel. But this perfection comes at a cost. That uniform crystalline structure is a superhighway for corrosion. When rust forms on the surface of an unprotected steel beam, it finds a perfectly arranged lattice of iron atoms ready to be consumed. There are no barriers. The rust can propagate freely and quickly, which is why a small scratch on a car can become a huge problem. This isn't to say all modern steel is doomed. Far from it. Alloys like stainless steel or weathering steels like Core 10 are specifically engineered for incredible corrosion resistance, far surpassing ancient iron. But for the common unprotected carbon steel that builds so much of our world, the problem remains. We have created a material that, while strong, is also vulnerable if its protective coatings are breached. The Vikings didn't have electron microscopes, but through generations of trial and error, and a deep intuitive connection with their materials, they master a system that works with the material's natural properties. They understand that the key to durability isn't just about what you take out, but about what you intelligently leave in. Section 6. The Other Viking Secrets The internal slag layers are the foundational secret, but it isn't their only trick. The mastery of a Viking smith is a multi-layered expertise, First is their sophisticated control of carbon. They understand that pure iron is soft. To make it hold an edge, you need to turn it into steel by adding carbon. They do this through a process called carburization, essentially soaking the iron in hot charcoal to let carbon migrate into its surface. They also master pattern welding, forge welding bars of soft iron and hard steel together to create a blade that is both tough and sharp. Beyond the metal structure, smiths may also employ effective surface treatments. One possibility is oil quenching. When hardening a steel edge, the red-hot metal is plunged into a liquid to cool it rapidly. While many liquids work, using oil or animal fat has an interesting side effect. Some of the oil polymerizes on the hot surface, creating a thin black water-resistant layer. This is the same principle behind seasoning a modern cast iron skillet. While direct evidence for its routine use purely as a rust proofer is debated, the chemical principle is sound and may have provided an added layer of protection, especially for tools and fittings constantly exposed to the elements. When you combine all these elements, you begin to see a complete picture. This isn't a single secret, but a system of interlocking technologies learned through generations of hands-on experience. We began with a simple question, how can a thousand-year-old Viking artifact outlast modern steel? We've journeyed from the bogs of Scandinavia to the fiery heart of the bloomery, and the answer we've found is more profound than a single lost recipe. The secret to Viking iron's longevity is a fundamental philosophy of making. It is the acceptance and indeed the masterful manipulation of so-called imperfection. Our modern age is defined by a quest for purity. In doing so, we create metals of incredible strength, but also of inherent vulnerability. Modern carbon steel is like a thoroughbred racehorse, powerful but fragile without protection. Viking iron, by contrast, is a mongrel. Its strength comes not from purity, but from its carefully managed impurities. The microscopic threads of glassy slag, a remnant of the earth it came from, are not a flaw to be eliminated, but a superpower to be embraced. These internal barriers, woven into the metal under the hammer, give the iron an innate resistance to the decay that consumes our own creations. When you see a piece of rusting modern metal, remember this story. Remember that our obsession with sterile perfection can create unintended vulnerabilities. And when you see a Viking artifact preserved against the centuries, recognize it for what it is, a testament to an older and in some ways a wiser way of thinking. They left behind a lesson in resilience, ingenuity and metallurgy that we are only now beginning to fully relearn. If this opened your eyes to forgotten technology, make sure you're subscribed. Drop a comment telling us what ancient tech you want us to uncover next. Thanks for watching.